So welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ronnie Bola. Um, Ronnie, one word, next word, Bola. Not Ron Ebola, um, if I said that too quickly. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, making acquaintance with Dr. Bola through the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology's Leadership Development Program. He's one of their current nominees and participants, and it's a, it's a highly competitive uh, program to be uh, welcomed into. Uh, the Moran has a budding partnership uh, with his uh, hospital, San Fernando Hospital, uh, on the island of Trinidad. And uh, from, from this point forward, there will be uh, quite, quite an exchange uh, between, between the programs as we try to build a residency program there and uh, help host and train some of their uh, physicians and their residents. So he has some uh, really interesting uh, talks this morning uh, to deliver, and I know we'll all enjoy it. So, Dr. Bull. Uh, good, good morning, everybody, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks for allowing me to speak this morning at the Grand Rounds. Um, I'm from Trinidad uh, and Tobago. We are a twin island state, and just to let you know where we are, because some people may not have been to the Caribbean area, most people know Jamaica. We're not too far from Jamaica. We're actually at the end or the bottom of the chain of islands in the Caribbean. And we are this little small island. And I bring you greetings from our little island. Uh, I hope in the future that uh, residents or trainees as well as uh, faculty would be able to visit the island and help us develop ophthalmology and also you'll be able to enjoy some of the beautiful beaches and all the other stuff that I have in these slides uh, so you, you can come and see and enjoy. So uh, I am uh, Ron Ebola, not Ebola. Um, I, I, uh, my specialty is vitreo retinal surgery and one of the reasons I'm here and we'll talk a little more about this on faculty day because they allow me 10 minutes to talk about the uh, partnership between uh, Trinidad and Tobago and the Moran. Um, but we are looking to develop a partnership to try and improve training in Trinidad and in, in ophthalmology and try to build a public eye facility to try and develop services for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. That's eye services. Today I'll I'll talk um, a little bit about some new surgical uh, techniques that I've been using, about three. If we have more time, I'll, I'll talk a little more about some of the cases, interesting cases that we see and do. Um, <coughs> so I'll give about three talks. Uh, I, I know it's said two, but I'll probably try and add a couple on. So the first uh, talk is on troca assisted sutureless sulcus scleral fixation of a PC IOL. It's really nice to start to talk a little bit clinical because I've only been talking about some academic stuff for the last week or two. So um, implantation of an IOL with insufficient capsular support still remains a surgical challenge. And the AC IOL uh, is associated with corneal decompensation and angle-related glaucoma, as we know. The PC sutured IOL uh, related, th th there are problems, uh, suture erosion, suture tract infection, and ophthalmitis and IOL displacement. This is the lens that I chose to, uh, to, to sulcus fixate, and it's, it's a good lens, I, I like it. It's a soft tech three, three piece foldable, and the haptics are, are polyimide haptics, and they are very flexible and they support really well. We've done eight eyes of eight patients, and all cases had primary surgery for some severe ocular trauma. And if you do get the opportunity to come out to Trinidad, we see a lot of uh, severe trauma. It's a very violent uh, type society. So if you come out there, you have to be a little careful. <laughs> and as this case showed, we had a posterior scleral rupture here before we were able to implant the lens. So the procedure, the first thing you need to do is, is, is get an infusion in. You can either use an AC 
uh, maintainer or a post or a pass planar infusion. Then uh, do sclerostomies, one, 180 degrees apart, about two millimeters from the limbus, as you see here. This I, I use a 20 gauge MVR, and then just, just make it a little bit wider. Um, inserting the lens, you, it you could insert the lens as you do normally for cataract surgery. Just make sure the trailing haptic uh, is outside the eye when you, when you insert the lens. So just d don't put it on top of the lens as you load the lens, and it will allow the haptic to remain outside the eye. If, there, if the lens is in the back of the eye on the retina, you can just rescue it, you bring it up, and, and ex extubate the haptics through the sclerostomies. Sorry, externalize the haptics. So here, you could use a forceps to do that, 23-gauge uh, forceps, as you see here, and um, a lens dial to maneuver the lens into position. The haptics are very flexible, so you don't need to grab it at the tip. You could grab it anywhere along its length and just pull it through the 19-gauge sclerostomy. To externalize the haptics, I use a bimanual technique most of the times where you use the dial to bring the haptic into view, and then you, uh, once you can see the haptic, you grab it with the forceps. Uh, the next step is to introduce the trocar. Uh, you introduce the trocar half thickness. Uh, you make in half thickness intrascleral tunnels with the with the MVR blade and the trocar. It's a 25 gauge uh, MV MVR trocar system, and this is what it looks like when it's in place. Then you, there are two methods I use. Uh, the, me the first method is to take the a suture tie-in forceps, hold the, the uh, haptic and, and insert it or feed it into the troca, as you see there. <coughs> the second method, which I, I like a little more, is to use a vicral suture. It doesn't have to be teno, it could be eto. So you, you, you tie it onto the um, haptic and then you pass the suture through the troca and then feed the haptic into the, 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 the uh, troca and pull the haptic into the entire length of the tunnel. So this, this second method allows you to get the haptic through the entire length of the tunnel and gives you a little more flexibility with uh, haptic placement. So here's me pulling the suture and haptic into the troca and into the tunnel. And then at the end, you just remove the troca, and as you see here, the haptic now is through the entire length of the tunnel. And you can see the haptic now at the distal end of the tunnel. You just use a, a forceps and push it back so that it doesn't protrude through the, tr through the distal end. And as you can see, the, these IOLs are extremely well centered at the end. Okay, so this is the sclerostomy, superior, inferior sclerostomies. They don't have to be at six on 12 o'clock. In these very difficult cases, the, you, uh, sorry, trauma cases, the, you, you may not be able to get six and 12 o'clock. So here is the, the IOL inserted, and now here is the inferior haptic being uh, externalized at six o'clock. And then I do the same thing uh, with the superior haptic, bring it uh, in the ciliary sulcus area behind the iris with the dial. And then you go in now with the 23 gauge forceps. You just pull the optic and that brings the haptic into view. 
once you get the haptic, um, sorry, the, the haptic, you just pull it through the superior sclerostomy. And once you have the both haptics externalized, the next step is to uh, create the intraskleral uh, tunnels with the 25 gauge troca and then feed the haptic into the uh, troca and that will put the haptic in the scleral tunnel. And you just remove the troca and that puts the haptic into the tunnel itself. So you feed the haptic into the troca, as you see here, right in, and then you just remove the troca and that leaves it. And these lenses are very, very well centered. Then we suture, well, I, I suture these um, sclerostomies with etovicryl. And it, it looks really nice. And they, they remain pretty good, well centered. Okay, I'll show you the next video. Yeah, that, that one has the tie-in. So this is the second method. This is the method I really like. I just showed you the first method because that's what I started to do. Ooh, sorry. So in this method, um, first of all, you make you, you just create the tunnels the same way I, I did before. And once you have your tunnels, uh, in this, this one you'll see I just extubate this haptic just a little differently. Uh, I could see it. This was a much more dilated pupil, so it's a bit easier. So I tie the suture on the haptic, and then I pass the suture through the tunnel. I feed the haptic into the, tro into the troca and the tunnel. And now I'm pulling the suture and haptic into the tunnel. Remove the troca. And here you could see the haptic at the distal end of the tunnel all the way through. And that's the suture there. So the suture is connected to the haptic and I just feed the haptic back into the scleral tunnel and remove the suture. And these lenses look really well centered. So I, I would say suture aid, aided aids placement of the haptic into the troca. It allows for good control uh, of the haptic in the tunnel. You could push it back, you could pull it back out, and, and, and that's, that's a nice technique. It takes a little bit longer, but it, it's, it's better. And this is how these lenses look post-op. This is one of the cases. Um, follow-up, we've had about two to six months follow-up with most cases. We've seen no serious problem. Takes a little bit long when you now start. I, I, I did them under general anesthetic because it was a new technique. And now we, we do them under local anesthetic. It takes about half an hour to 40 minutes. <coughs> I, just to recap, place incisions about two millimeters from the limbus, use a 20 gauge MVR score it to 19 gauge and use 25 gauge trokers to keep the scleral tunnels open. Uh, Tenno or etovicryl, the important thing about the vicryl suture uh, is really the needle has to be long enough to go through the entire length of the troca, which is about four to five millimeters. So you're really looking at your needle, not, not so much the suture, suture size eight or smaller is, is, is okay. Haptic position in the tunnel can be adjusted by pulling on the suture or pushing the haptic back into the tunnel. I, I just want to let you all know we do have red rocks in Trinidad, but it's under the water. And we do have arches, but they are made of coconut branches. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions about this one? Yeah. Uh, 
they almost all had vitrectomies because they were complex um, cases. But I would have no concern doing it in an, in, in an, as an anterior segment procedure once you've cleared all the vitreous. Or, you know, if it was a vitrectomized eye, then you don't have a problem. But um, you would have to make sure you don't have vitreous as with any anterior segment procedure. Because if you did, then I would be getting involved with the posterior segment problem as well. That's why you need either eto or, or smaller suture. Because if you use a, a bigger vicral suture, like a 6-0 or, or smaller, it would affect the ability to pull. The knot would be too big. It wouldn't come through the trocar. You could just explain that again. It's under tension. Right. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen it, and the reports um, using the MA60 lens, which is the lens that has been used a lot, uh, hasn't shown that that's happened, but that is a concern, that it could come back into the eye and, and there may be a problem with it, but I haven't seen any reports on that. Yes, yes, I have. He, he uses, he actually extubates it through a point uh, tunnel. And then he creates a flap, a, a, a scleral flap. And he puts the haptic under the flap and glues it on. Um, that looks like a really nice technique but it involves a lot more surgery. You have to cut the sclera, and um, you also have to use glue or something else to close the flaps. So I think it's, it's a good technique, but I really like this technique because when you create those thin tunnels, it's almost like you lock the haptics in, and I really like that. These lenses look really nice and well-centered post-op. So probably feel a little more comfortable talking about the retina. So um, I, I know a lot of people here may not um, enjoy this that as much as me, but uh, we'll have to bear it a little bit. So I'm just going to talk about viscodelamination in diabetic vitrectomies. Um, we have a, a huge diabetic uh, population in Trinidad, and if ever the, you, you get the opportunity to come down, I could promise you you'll see a lot of diabetic advanced diabetic disease, and you'll see a lot of advanced diabetic surgical maneuvers. And um, I, I think that would be a benefit for, for fellows as well as residents who may attend or be able to come. 
and you'll also be able to enjoy some of the beaches that we have and we have sun all year round and our lowest temperature is probably 25 degrees Celsius I don't know how much Fahrenheit that is but it's hot <laughs> And that's Tobago, that's our twin small island, but Trinidad is not to be outdone. We also have leatherback turtles, they come up on the beaches, three, four hundred come up um, for the season. And so you'll get to see these large uh, turtles and you'll also get to see the, the, the birds. We have uh, a wide array of birds. This is our national bird, it's called the scarlet ibis. And you'll visit the Karani swamp and see them light up the sky all red. Okay, I'll just talk a little bit about clinical stuff now. So the aim in delamination really is to really remove the membranes uh, as completely as you can. And this is a case here showing the, the membranes. For the residents, uh, tractional retinal detachment really is caused by small vitreoretinal adhesions as you see here. This is one with a TRD involving the macula. Sometimes you get these broad base vitreoretinal adhesions, as you see here. And these, this is when it becomes a little more difficult because to try and remove these uh, demands a little more uh, surgical maneuvers and techniques gets more difficult if you have a hole in the retina and you have a combined tractional uh, rigmatogenous detachment. Gets a little more difficult if it's left for months and months because then you get localized PVR and the retina and the membrane sticks together. And that's when you need more advanced techniques. The principles of diabetic vitrectomy, the first step is to achieve adequate visualization of the retina by clearing the media opacity, that is cataract, uh, vitreous hemorrhage. Release all the traction on the retina and we we, we like to apply a lot of endophotocoagulation because these eyes are very ischemic. There's a high chance of them, these eyes going rubiotic post-op. And we use a retinal tamponade and scleral buckling <coughs> when necessary. There's two methods of dissection I, I use from time to time. One is segmentation and the other one's end block dissection. Segmentation is where we remove the membranes in between the pegs or, or fibrovascular proliferative attachments and then you, you are left with these little pegs at, at the end. End block dissection, we, you cut the pegs themselves and you remove the whole membrane as, as one block. On average, I do about 500 vitrectomies a year and about 200 of these are really diabetic related vitrectomies. Out of those 200, about uh, a third have rigmatogenous combined retractional. That amounts to about one to two every week. The reason we could use this technique now, this uh, viscodelamination technique so well, is because of the advances in vitrectomy. Small gauge vitrectomy, high speed cutting, pressure infusion systems, uh, chandelier illumination. My standard technique is using a four port uh, vitrectomy technique and I use two self-sealing troca uh, at the top to, to, give to, to allow the instruments to go in. One is an infusion and the other one is a chandelier. I usually start with indentation vitrectomy. It's important to remove the vitreous relly, not at the vitreous base relly, that's not so important, but at the ports, because you're gonna go in and out with instruments and you don't want to be pulling on the vitreous. Um, to do the delamination, it's best to use a high magnification lens where possible, so you get really good visualization of the space. I usually start um, with a spatula, 23 gauge spatula and vitrector in the other hand. You get the spatula under the membrane, make sure it's safe, then put the cutter in place. Then I usually move on to the forceps and, and pull, pull on the membranes. 
um, usually pull along the retina surface to lift the membrane up, but you have to be really careful with these atrophic, um, very thin retinas because they could tear. And this is the instrument I use for viscodissection. It's a 30 gauge tip, but a 20 gauge instrument. So you'll have to cut the, um, the 23 gauge port if you're going to go to viscodissection. You place the viscodissector uh, underneath the membrane, as you see here. And then in the other hand, you, you come in with the cutter under the membrane to cut the membrane. This is the video. So the first thing I do is do a, a, a bimanual vitreous base shave and remove the vitreous. And then here I use a, another bimanual technique. Um, so you really switch in hands a lot um, with the spatula. So this is the spatula here. This is the vitrector in the other hand. And you just lift the membranes and remove them. So here again, the spatula lifting the membrane up. And again, spatula now switch left to right, spatula in, in right, uh, cutter in left. So a lot of bimanual maneuvers uh, is, is done to limit the amount of in and out movements of instruments. Again, cutter in, in, the, in the left, uh, spatula in the right. After a while, the spatula, you can't do much more, so th then I pull with the forceps. You have to be careful. Don't pull up. You pull along the retina surface, and you're really watching where the tractional areas are, and it could be away from the forceps, so you have to watch very carefully. So pulling is a bit dangerous. You have to be careful. Again, bimanually. Cutter in the right, um, forceps in the left. And there, there comes a point when you realize if you pull any further, you're going to tear the retina. And then you have to stop and use another maneuver. So here you can see this very atrophic, thin retina. And I'm pulling, and you'll see it's going to tear here. So you, have to, you can't use this technique any longer. I then move on to the, uh, I don't, well, actually here I move to this side. But this, I don't think this worked out. So I, I moved on to viscodissection. So here is the visco dissector placed under the membrane, and I'm injecting viscoelastic. And once I create a space between the membrane and the retina, I leave viscoelastic between the two tissues, come in with the cutter with the other hand, and just now cut safely between the membrane and the retina. So now I've segmented out this, this area here. And you can see you're not going in and out with instruments. You're just keeping these two instruments in the eye. It's much, much safer when, when, when done using a bimanual technique. Also, you can uh, remove membranes way out in the periphery, which is very difficult to do uh, with other techniques. So now we're removing membranes all the way out in the mid-periphery. So it's a really handy technique for membranes that are difficult to remove in the in the in the periphery and you continue doing that until you remove uh, all the membrane So segmentation really is, is what uh, the technique uh, that's been used here, uh, viscodissection. And so we're trying to get from here to, to here. Now, as you see in the, la in the video, this is when I just started to do it. I used to leave a lot of little islands. I, I didn't get much problems leaving the islands, but now you can even remove these little islands as, as we get better and better. Uh, I, I always use some anti-VEGF before. Uh, we have Evastin, so that's what I like. I use it about a, a week or two before surgery. I use, I like a four-port technique with the chandelier and, and using bimanual techniques. I, I like that. 
it's very important to clear the 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 ports before doing the the maneuvers, the vitre vitrectomy maneuvers. You can use a single-handed or bimanual viscodissection technique um, and use high magnification as much as possible. Uh, start with the cutter, then move to the spatula and forceps, and always remember to do endophotocoagulation and either cryo or laser to the port area. Just to let you know that if you do come to Trinidad, these are uh, domestic injuries. So be very careful with the women in Trinidad that you may find. <laughs> and probably don't go to the kitchen with them because this is a kitchen utensil being used. I didn't want to scare you, but uh, be careful. We, we, we in vitrectomies, I see probably about, uh, I would say 50 to 60 trauma-related um, vitrectomies. So we get a lot of corneoscleral lacerations. We get a lot of intraocular foreign bodies. There isn't a lot of health and safety regulations. So the weed whacker was introduced a few years ago and we see a lot of IOFPs as a result of that. So if you do come, you'll get a lot of trauma um, experience. Thank you, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks very much. I'll show. Do, do we have time for one more? Okay. I'll show one more um, presentation. So I do do some general ophthalmology as well, and this is a presentation by one of our residents, um, and hopefully D Dr. Maraj would be able to visit the Moran at some time. She is one of our, uh, uh, I would say, one of the best residents we have, and she did this work, and I'm going to present some of her work. Um, this released a report, uh, our first five cases of, of successful graft fixation using the autologous blood uh, fixation of these grafts. Um, uh, Pterygium is very common in, in, uh, in the tropics. Um, prevalence range from 0.03 to, 20 to 29% in the literature and I would say probably one in 10 in, in Trinidad. The main aims of pterygium excision is, is to achieve uh, a cosmetically acceptable outcome, to restore the ocular surface integrity, and to try and prevent uh, the, 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 the recurrence of the growth. Do you all see a, a lot of pterygiums here? No? Okay. Currently, there's a number of surgical techniques that exist for removing these pterygiums. The bare sclera technique, the use of anti-metabolites such as mitomycin C, amniotic membrane grafting, and conjunctival autografting. The bare sclera technique is associated really with unacceptably high recurrence rates, and it's really not used anymore. The, sorry. The use of anti-metabolites carry a significant risk of site threatening complications. And really, we s we're left with conjunctival autografting because it has the lowest recurrence rate as well as less uh, site threatening problems. 
And this is some of the recurrence rates from the literature. And as you can see, conjunctival autografting is the lowest. So when we do the graphs, we you could use suture or you could use fibrin glue, which is, is pretty good. And we're really moving away from sutures to fixate graphs because sutures are thought to have a higher recurrence rate. Uh, and this meta-analysis just highlights that. And sutures are really have, have other complications, as you see here, granuloma formation, foreign body sensation, and others. But glue also has drawbacks. You know, it, it is uh, manufactured from pooled human plasma and therefore carries a theoretical risk of transmission of prion diseases and viral diseases and there's a potential risk of anaphylactic shock. So other than that, why use autologous blood? Well, autologous blood is readily affordable because it's the patient's own blood. You don't have to pay for it. It's accessible, and there are no suture-related problems. So we conducted, it's our first five cases. So you know we, we looked at those first five in a small, prospective, non-comparative interventional series looking at five eyes of five patients. All had primary nasal pterygia. All were patients of the ophthalmology unit at the hospital, general hospital. All patients received suture-free, glue-free, autologous blood fixation of the graft. Patients who were on aspirin or anticoagulant medication were excluded. The patients were followed for three months to determine recurrence, cosmetic outcome, and comfort. They were seen at day one, day four, week three, six, and three months. Post-operative pain was recorded using a non-linear pain scale, which consisted of four choices, non, mild, moderate, or severe. Patients were asked to grade their overall cosmetic result with the procedure using the following choices, poor, fair, accept acceptably good, or excellent. The technique, uh, this section of the pterygium of the sclera, cornea, and conjunctiva. Uh, then uh, you allow a thin film of blood to clot over the bare sclera area while we dissect the, uh, the flap, no, sorry, the graft. We inject local anesthetic at the harvest site to separate the tenons from, or help separate the tenons from the conjunctiva and to allow dissection of the conjunctiva with a tenon-free graft. Meticulous dissection, uh, removing the conjunctiva and dissecting off as much tenons as possible. And then we align the graft on the thin film of blood uh, in this area. I usually use tie and forceps to uh, uh, fixate the graft or, or to place the graft into the area. And this is the graft in position here over the thin film of blood. So first you do the standard dissection or removal of the pterygium, um, as you see here. Then I do a hydro type of hydro dissection and that gives you a, a, a plane to separate the conjunctiva from the tenons, so you get less tenons to dissect out. And then I meticulously dissect as much tenons off as possible, so you get a really thin graft, as you see here. And I just move the graft over to the other side, use two tie and forceps to position the graft. and just put the graft in position, as you see there. I, I usually wait about three minutes minimum um, to allow the graft to, to settle and fixate, and then just remove the speculum. Post-op, we just use uh, uh, antibiotic uh, steroid combination uh, for about three weeks. A total of five eyes of five patients underwent the procedure. All patients were female and had primary nasal pterygium. 
average follow-up time was three months. There were no intraoperative or postoperative complications requiring intervention. However, one patient had a cross graph recurrence. Visual acuity was unaffected in all five. And this is some of the cases. Case one, the one post-op, graph well positioned, excellent cosmesis, according to the patient. Day four, looks really nice. Case two, pre-op. Case two, graph well fixated. Case two, however, is the case that developed the recurrence um, about uh, three months post-op. But as you can see, it, it really, and, and we've seen this patient up to six months now, and it really hasn't changed, and the patient is pretty happy with it. Case three, day one post-op, pretty good. Case four, graph, uh, well positioned. Case four, months later, looks, looks really nice. And w another case had a, a, a bit of a slippage of the graft, but really not cosmetically a problem. Seen months later and, and, and looks, pr looks pretty good. So there was one case of recurrence which occurred between six weeks and three months uh, follow-up, and one patient experienced a slippage of the graft in this series. Cosmetically, uh, either good or, or excellent results according to the patients and pain or almost no pain really in, in the group. So we recommend a few things. One is I, I like to hydrodissect here. I'm not sure if this is the right word to use but we, we inject the, the some an anesthetic to get uh, uh, less tenons to dissect off on the graft. And also, we, we, you must try to get the, the graft as tenons free as possible for it to stick better. There, there is a little concern sometimes uh, at the end when, when you remove the speculum, make sure that the graft doesn't uh, move, especially the superior part of the graft. So after removal of the speculum, just check and make sure your graft is in position. This really was just a small five case report of our first ex uh, experience with the procedure and we would like to do more work on it and uh, have a, a larger study population to look at and, and do a comparative series. Um, however, we found that the procedure uh, looks, looks like there is, uh, uh, it's worth pursuing and it's worth looking at in more detail. There's, there's no real uh, pain post-op, good cosmesis. It's quick and easy to perform, and it's easy to reproduce. From the literature, uh, there are reports using this procedure, and they also have low recurrence, well, low recurrence, and really uh, good outcomes. Uh, our experience is that it's affordable, it's easily accessible, and there are no, no complications with it so far. And we are trying to look at a larger series at, at this point in time. We really want to look at the recurrence rate a little more accurately because we've only looked at five cases. So we want to do ab about 100 and see what is the true recurrence rate using this procedure. <coughs> This is our national instrument. It's the only instrument that has been um, invented in the last 100 years. It's the steel pan. So when you come to Trinidad, this is our national flag. You'll hear the steel pan quite a lot, especially if you come around carnival time, where we have this big carnival. It's bigger than Rio, we think. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Any questions about the pterygium fixation? Anybody? Uh, using what, what techniques you all use here to do the graphs? We use, uh, glue. glue. Yeah, um, we have glue, but it's not available in the public service. So, if we did have glue, maybe we could compare glue to blood. I mean, that would be something to look at. You know. Yes. 
Yes, yes. Uh, you, you know, we, we s I'm very surgically minded, but you must pre-op these patients well <coughs> before surgery. <laughs> Um, we don't operate on patients who have uh, ocular surface problems um, that, that could be treated and not treated. So if they have blepharitis or they have other ocular surface uh, conditions, we usually ensure that we treat that way before uh, doing, do, doing the procedure. It, it would help, we think, with reducing the likelihood of recurrence. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it's a perfect technique, I think, is what he uses, you know, P-E-R-F-E-C-T. And uh, I think it's worth, um, as Jeff said there, when, we, when you're dissecting the, 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 uh, the pterygium to lift the conjunctiva and get underneath the conjunctiva and remove tenons, because that, that is where the problem seems to start. And if you could remove tenons, as, as much tenons as you can, I think you're going to reduce recurrence. So we probably don't need to remove as, as wide a, a conjunctiva as, as you see in, some, in the video. Um, but that one was actually a recurrent uh, pterygium. So we, we did do a wide dissection. Yeah. 
I, I think um, I didn't mention, but we do use um, a subtenance uh, anesthetic. Um, so a peribulba would probably be a, a good idea. Um, what it does, it, 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 it reduces the, it allows you to, well, what we do after we give that block is we pad the eye and we usually leave them padded for uh, a day so that you don't get much movement of the eyeball underneath the pad to displace the graft. So there, are th there is a few little things we do other than just um, put the graft on that I didn't mention. So if you want to use the technique, I think uh, you could email me. That might be the best thing uh, before. <laughs> and I could tell you all the little bits that we do before uh, and after to try to get the graft to not displace uh, and for this to work. Good. Well, well t thanks very much. Thank you.